Galatians chapter 1. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Appreciate your faithfulness to uh, the study tonight. Uh, we're going to just jump right in if we could. And uh, so Galatians chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. What, what is Paul doing here? Why would he start a letter this way? Um, typically, if you were to write a letter, um, I don't think you would write a letter. Uh, I don't think I would write my letter to someone. Um, this is Larry Luffman, um, who hath obtaineth uh, a bachelor's degree in pastoral theology and um, who has been in the ministry for 17 years. And I have lived in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and while I was in Jacksonville, Florida, I gained pastoral experience uh, for three years of my Bible college then moved to Daytona Beach and pastored there on staff for over six years. And then I moved here. No one would start off a letter that way. But why would Paul start off a letter, Paul an apostle, and then he, if you'll notice, gives kind of a clarity or an addendum here, not of men. But he, he is a man. Why would he say not of men? What, what is he doing that for? He's affirming his apostleship. Why would you have to affirm that, Paul? Why would you need to bring clarity to us regarding that? Why would you do that? Why do you feel like there's a need? Well, if you know the background, if you've been a part of this study at all, and by the way, every believer should know the book of Galatians. This book is an incredible book. Every Christian ought to get very intimate with this book. This book is very crucial to all of Paul's writings. And Paul is defending his authority that was given to him. Judaizers had come in. These were corrupt, uh, 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 these were corrupt religious people. These were people who had come in and they were contesting, they were opposing his authority and his apostleship. As a matter of fact, his apostleship, his authority is under attack. And so he starts off the letter this way, and what he's doing, Paul is establishing his authority. I, 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 my authority is not from men, neither by man. Uh, this wasn't, I didn't learn this from anyone. The disciples didn't teach this to me. I, I didn't read it in some book. I didn't get it by graduating from some school. I got this, but by Jesus Christ. So who gave Paul his apostleship? It's very simple, isn't it? Jesus Christ. He got it directly from Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. This is the one letter that Paul writes to a group of churches. Now, he wrote to churches, but he wrote to a lot of individual churches. But here, he's writing to a group of churches. He wrote one letter to a group of churches. Now, look at verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I love this verse because this verse is the key verse to this book or this chapter. This is a key verse. Notice it starts off with the key word of verse 3. It's the first word. What is that word, church? What is it? Say it. That's right. Aren't you thankful for grace? Amen? Now, listen, this is real important. We covered this in the last few weeks. If you missed any of the teaching, you can go online and get that. But this is real important because mankind is declaring war against God. Did you know that? Mankind is against God. Mankind doesn't want godly things. Mankind doesn't want 
God to rule their life. Mankind doesn't want to believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Mankind is making war against God. But one day, God is going to counter-declare that war. He's going to make a counter-declaration against all mankind in which God will absolutely pour out all His wrath and all His judgment upon mankind. That will be the day of wrath. That will be where all the nations, the Bible tells us, will come against God, and God will set the record straight, and He won't do it by sword. He won't do it by fighting physically. He'll do it by the power of His Word. He will speak, the Bible says. And at that day, God will make a counter-declaration. He will pour out His wrath someday. But we have learned, have we not, that God's wrath isn't being poured out today. He's withholding His wrath. He is holding back His wrath. So if He's holding back His wrath, then what is God dispensing today? What is God giving out today? If it's not His wrath, then what is He giving? He's giving His grace. Paul said, grace and peace to you. See, here's what's interesting. That is why Christ can offer us peace. It's because of the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, listen to me now, there'd be no peace in your life. If there was no grace of God, there'd be no salvation. There'd be no redemption. There'd be no cross of Calvary. There'd be no eternal salvation if it wasn't for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the grace of God. So the Apostle Paul writes this letter, this epistle, if you will. And he wrote this because his heart was hurt. His heart was aching for the people. Because while he establishes his, his apostleship, while he establishes his authority, while he teaches and reminds them of the grace and peace that God is offering and not, uh, he's not pouring out his wrath, he's withholding his wrath. While all these things are being taught and while Paul had been teaching these things, false teachers had come in. People had taken the word of God and they started corrupting the doctrines of grace that Paul was teaching to them. They were corrupting it. And that's the continual battle it is for us today that live in this age of grace, folks. That's why it's so important that we absolutely fight for the doctrine and spiritually fight, I mean, to the doctrine and the teaching of the unadulterated Word of God. You have no authority, neither do I, to change this book. We have every responsibility, though, though, to obey this book, but absolutely no authority to change it. These believers in this church, or these churches of Galatia, had been rejoicing in God's grace, but something had happened. They were walking in faith in Christ until all of a sudden these false teachers had come in and had infiltrated the church, and now all of a sudden, they decided to change what they believe. I've seen that over and over in the church. I've seen that over and over in this church since I've been here for nine years. I've seen people come and go. I've seen people leave this church for whatever reason, none doctrinally, but leave this church. Now hear this in your spirit now. Leave this church and go to a church. Hold it. Go to a church that teaches diametrically opposite of eternal security. That's a problem. How in the world can you be a professing Christian and go to another church, another belief system, that would absolutely corrupt the teaching of God's grace and faith alone in Jesus Christ and somehow start to believe in a false system that somehow you must do something to be saved. My friend, that is false doctrine. 
Now, if you're going to leave a church, that's a reason to leave a church. But how can someone leave and absolutely go and sit under teaching that is absolutely not in God's Word? I don't care how good the music is. I don't care how many of your family members go there. You listen to me now. You better be under the sound teaching of God's Word and nothing else. That is the premise of why you go. If you don't like the music, buy a CD. Amen? Amen. Go to a concert if you have to. But the Church of Christ, listen to me, some of you ain't going to like this, is not built on music. It's built on the Word of God. Amen! Now, I love music. I love music, don't I, Zach? I love music. I love good music. I even love the first song that you sang, Charity. I thought you could be a little louder, but I love that music. I, I love it all. You got enough twang to pull that song off in you. Someone said, Amen. <laughs> Listen, I love all types of genres of music. I do, I do, I love it. I do. But I'm going to tell you something. I didn't come here tonight for the music. Now, I am blessed by the music, but I'm going to tell you something. If there's no word, then what is the worship, what is the music complimenting? If there's no Bible... If there's no Bible to have, if there's no God to exalt, if there's no Christ to love, so it's important that we absolutely stay true to the Word of God. So my heart letter to you would be, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, make sure you stay in this book and don't accept any, absolutely any counterfeit. Now let's jump to verse 4, may we? Notice who. Who gave himself for our sins. The who is Jesus Christ. It is referring, it is an antecedent to the verse before us. Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he, Christ, might deliver us sinners from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I thank God that he loved me enough in eternity to think of me and know that I'm going to need a Savior. Because I could not save myself, that in myself I was corrupt, I was totally filled in sin, I was enamored with sin. I'm going to love sin. I'm going to follow sin. And left on my own, I'm going to send myself straight to hell. But God saw. The Bible says that in due time, God sent forth His Son. And I love that. And in your handout, it says the only reason that grace and peace of the verse 3 that we read can be offered is because Christ gave himself for our sin. There is no grace and peace without Christ. Did you hear that tonight? There is no grace and peace without Jesus Christ. We know God is holy. Yes, he is. We know that God is loving. Yes, he is. But we also know that God is a holy and righteous judge, and he cannot condone sin. Sin must be judged, and the penalty of sin is death, according to to Romans 6 23 now I'd like for you to put a bookmarker here in Galatians 1 we got to come back to it for that is our text and I'd like for you to go to the last book of your Bible Revelation chapter 20 we read this verse last week but I'd like to just plug it in for tonight and I'd like for you to realize how serious God takes sin and it's pretty serious if someone sends their son to die for it, I think you ought to take it serious. God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God so loved that world that that's exactly what he did. For God so loved you so much that he sent his very best. What did he do? He sent himself. Look at verse 14, though, of Revelation chapter 20. Are you there? Say amen if you are. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Wait a minute. I better tune in and I better pay attention because this means there's a problem. This means that something is coming. This means that there is an ultimate demise for those who are not in Christ. Look at verse 15. And it says that and explains it. And. So let's read it with the conjunction and. Verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who gets this punishment? Who gets this judgment? Who gets this wrath? Only those who are not written in the book of life. Well, I don't. I don't want that. Then your name better be written in the book of life now, shouldn't it? There's no other way by which man shall be saved. Yes, God is a judge, but he's not only a judge. He's also a God of justice. He's also a God of love. And, and, and here's what he did. So if you would leave Revelation 20, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Let's look at this again. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're in a Bible study tonight, so that means we'll be in the Bible a little bit. And look at verses 19 and 20. And this is the remedy that Christ gave. So you don't have to experience, so we don't have to experience Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Notice 2 Corinthians 5, and look at verse 19 and 21. To wit, that God was in Christ... Doing what? Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Not placing upon them what they deserve. But hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now verse 21. For he, God, hath made him Christ to be sin for us. Wait a minute. Christ hadn't done any sin. Christ did not sin. That's exactly right. But he made him to be sin. In other words, it is just as if Christ sinned. He did sin, but all the sin that you and I have done, and all the world for all eternity until the world end, was placed on Jesus on that day. For God made him to be sin for us. Notice this. Who knew no sin, just to clarify and make sure we're not messing this thing up, who knew no sin, what's the benefit? What's the profit? Here, here it is. That we, the sinners, might be made, wait a minute, no longer sinner, but might be made the what? Now I know I don't look like nothing but a, a big hunk of flesh to you up here. But I'm going to tell you right now, According to God and from his heart and from his eyes through Christ, you are looking at righteousness tonight. <laughs> Man, it feels weird to say it as weird as it is for you to receive it. You're just going to have to get over it. Amen? I don't make it up. Is that what your Bible says? If your Bible didn't say that, then you don't have a Bible. You need to throw it away. Your book, your holy book, says, made the righteousness of God. I've messed up since I'm a sinner. I know, since I'm a Christian, I know you have. This isn't about what you do. This is about who you are in Christ. This is about your new identity, amen? Man, this is who I am now, according to him. I didn't say according to you. If we live by each other's standard, <laughs> no one would get into heaven. Amen? Everybody be judged and criticized. 
We've got to live by God's rule. We've got to live by God's standard. That we might be made the righteousness of God. Now notice, in Him. Now folks, let's just get our spirit correct here and make sure we're on the right page. If there's any good in you, it is all Jesus. He gets 100% credit, right? There is no good in you except Jesus. It's all Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you, not only is that a hard pill to swallow sometimes, because sometimes we think we're all right, I didn't earn any bit of this, Miss Berta. Do you realize that? I didn't earn any of this. And as a matter of fact, I didn't deserve any of this. All because of verse 3. <laughs> Grace and peace to you, Christ. Christ gave himself for us. All because of Jesus. I am the total benefit or benefactor of what Jesus has done. So, the good news is, in your handout, would you write this in? When a sinner believes on Jesus Christ and accepts Him as their Savior, a complete change of identity occurs. That's right. I'm so thankful for that. Now, you don't mind keep writing we know though that those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ have been delivered from this present world and from the wrath that will come upon it man I thank God that I'm not in Revelation 20 14 and 15 uh, that is not my death I have eternal life, not eternal death. I thank God for that. However, those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ will endure that wrath. I want to say, you, say to you tonight that we, if you're saved, are delivered. Amen? I am rescued. I am saved. You, that word saved, it can be overused and undervalued. It, 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 it is overused and not understood. That word saved means to be delivered. It means to be rescued. I am saved all the time through Jesus Christ. Yes, I received eternal salvation when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you tonight, and this is a good uh, doctoral theological teaching here, you are constantly being redeemed and saved through Jesus Christ. He's always saving your hind parts. Amen? There's a constant saving going on. Now, I'm not talking about to heaven. Thank God I've already had that. That's a one-time deal. But there's a constant renewing and rescuing that I need. Why? Because I can foul it up pretty quickly. It doesn't take us long to derail, does it? No, it doesn't. I want to show you something. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I want you to see this from another writing of the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and then we'll look at chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, and then we'll go somewhere else. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. When he shall come, listen to that. That's the wrong verse. That's 2 Thessalonians. I knew that wasn't the right verse. All right, verse 10. This is right. I'm like, wow, that's going to be a contextual problem right there for this verse. I knew that wasn't right. All right, amen. Aren't you, aren't you glad that 
you know you're viable enough to know that when, when you're in the wrong place, you're in the wrong place. That's why we don't misapply or not rightly divide God's Word. Some people might just trudge on through that and try to make, you know, a square peg fit in a round hole. No, that's not it. Wrong verse. Sorry about that. Verse 10, maybe you already knew that. And to wait for His Son from heaven, notice this, who He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from Revelation 20. Amen. It delivered us from the wrath to come. Hey, I've been rescued. You know, Gilligan and the skipper could never get off that island. I mean, they were just dingleberries. I mean, they just couldn't figure it out. No matter what they did, I mean, they were just two peas in a pod. And uh, no matter what skipper would come up, Gilligan would have a way of kind of messing it up. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get off this island. Amen. I'm going to get off this island. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be rescued. And I'm going to be rescued for all eternity. And I thank God for that. And so should you. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All right. That, that is right. I'm looking at my notes. I, I think I'm still on target. Here we go. For God, this is verse 9, chapter 5, verse 9, same book. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by, through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is because of Jesus that grace and peace can be offered to you. Why? Because Christ gave himself for us. This is the magnitude of what Christ has done. But in your notes, that's only part of it. That's only part of it. The, the, the saving us from the wrath to come giving us a new identity, that's only part of it. In your handout, it gets better and better. And I want you to write this in. God has also made us members of a new kingdom. Would you write that in? He has made us members of a new kingdom. There is a couple verses in your handout. Colossians 1.13. You only have to turn to it. It's right in your notes. Would you look at it? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us, that means to place, okay, us into the kingdom of his dear son. Say, what does that mean? It is as good if I, as if I'm already there. I, some of you probably uh, know that old song. I've got a reservation and newness of life. I've got a reservation, folks. It, it's mine. Okay? It, it's mine. I've been redeemed. I'm going to redeem that coupon. I'm going. I, I'm going to show up. I don't know when. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I'm going to show up to that. Why? I look forward to the redeeming factor. I have been spared. I've been relieved. I have been redeemed. I have been delivered. Now notice the second verse there. It's right under that, 2 Timothy 4, 18. And the Lord shall, there it is again, deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I have a place to go when I draw my last breath this side of heaven. God has prepared a place for me. And I know we love to sing about mansions in the sky and streets of gold and gates of pearl and all that lovely stuff. Listen, I, I don't care if it's a shack. I don't care if it's a pop-up tent. I don't, I don't care about that. Anywhere with Jesus will be just okay. Will be just fine. Doesn't matter where. Doesn't matter what, I, what I'm walking on. Yeah, it'll be nice. Walk on streets of gold. I, 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 I mean... It, it, I mean, God uses gold as pavement up there. I, it, just, it just blows my mind away. But those aren't the reasons that I want to go. Of all that gold, I, it's not like I'm going to be buying stock, you know, with it. I won't need it. I'm going to have the riches of all heaven with me. Uh, and, and, and here's the beauty of this. You and I have all the riches of heaven in us right now. His name is Jesus. 
my friend, I don't want to go to heaven if Jesus isn't there. He's the centerpiece of heaven, not where I will be staying. I doubt very seriously I'll be hanging out in my house with my feet propped up watching news or watching a sport. Now, I don't think that that's not what's going to be happening. It, you're not going to be hanging out by, at the house wa- watching people walk by. Oh, hey, sir, good to see you. Didn't know you were going to make it, but you did. We won't be doing that in heaven. We'll be rejoicing and celebrating with our Lord and Savior for all eternity. It'll be a celebratory event that will not end. It'll be a party that you never leave. That's what it's going to be. That's, that's incredible to me. But that's what he's done. He's given us a new kingdom. There's another blessing from our identity being changed. And that is according to Ephesians 2, 2, 6. You don't have to turn there. According to Ephesians 2, 6, the Bible lets us know uh, that we have been seated in heavenly places. We have already been placed there. Did you know our, and, and this will make sense to you, our elected representatives in Washington, D.C. are said to be seated in the halls of Congress. Did you know that? You've probably heard that phrase. They are said to be seated in the halls of Congress. Here's the thing. Even when they are physically absent from that place. Did you know that? Even when they're not there. They use the phrase that they're seated in the halls of Congress. What does that mean? Their seats, literally, where they put their bottoms and do business there and talk and discuss and, 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 and go around and round and round and round. What it means is that their prestige, their honor, and their authority is there. Say, what, is, what does it mean? It's about their position. Now, you remember that. It's about your position. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are in Christ. Here's what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that we have been delivered from this evil world and that we're seated in the heavenlies. But how did it happen? Because we earned it? Because I deserved it? No, sir. According to Galatians uh, 1, if you'd go back there, verse 4 says, if you kept a bookmark, I hope you did. Verse 4 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. This is what God wanted. This is what he desires. And it's all because of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, If you're kind of wondering, how did Paul respond to this? Verse 5 tells us. Look at it. We're moving on. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. In your handout, what happened? The apostle Paul just breaks out in praise right here. He he, he wrote verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then gives a shout of an amen, hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. Amen. After what he just taught, what he just wrote, he got happy in Jesus. Yeah. Some Christians get over their salvation. I don't know how, but they do. Kind of wonder if they have it at all. Paul writes this, and he's writing this as not only an admonishment to correct the believers, He's also writing it to refute the false doctrine that was being taught. And even in the middle of this, he has a little worship session. He gets excited about Jesus. Because he reflects all that Christ has done for him right here. And he says, Man, how how this happened to you guys? How, how'd you move away from what you've you've known and been taught? See, Christ dying for our sins and 
our deliverance from this evil world and our new identity in heavenly places are all to God's glory. This belongs to His glory. Remember, look at verse 5. To whom be glory? This is placing it on a person. To whom? It didn't say to what. You're not a what. You know, a person is not a what. Did you know that? Hello, are you with me? That's good old English. I know I'm not the best at English, but I know a few things about it. What ain't a who? (laughs) A whom ain't a what? This, This isn't a thing. This is a person. To whom be glory and honor forever and ever, he says amen. All of this glory belongs to one person. Not me, Paul says, but Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. No wonder Paul got excited, isn't it? And so should you be as well. Why? Just look at what Christ has done for you. Have a review party. Roll back the reels in your mind. Review the tape, my friend. Go back and remember all that Christ has done for you. Quit sulking and being a sourpuss about the whole thing. And just remember, God's done so much for you. You don't worry about what other people are doing. You don't worry about if they're happy or not happy. Man, I tell you what, them sour lemons will make you, your face frown upside down. It'll, it, that stuff's contagious. But I tell you what, you can have your own party in Jesus by just remembering what he's done for you. And reflecting all that God's done for you. That's what Paul did. That might be a good reminder to you. And in your handout. God's glory and grace will be displayed through us in the ages to come. Did you know that? Now I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of glory hogs in the church. A lot of people like to put themselves on their own self-elevated platform as if they're God's gift to man or the church. Let me tell you right now, all the glory belongs to Jesus. You just get to be under the glory umbrella, amen? You know, they used to say, I want to be under the spout where the glory comes out. Some of you old-timers have heard some of that. Well, maybe this is where that came from. God gets all the glory. You don't get any of the credit. You just get the benefit, amen? Man, you get the overflow. God gets all the credit. He did it all. 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 He's doing it all. Now, if there's any bad parts, you did it all. We did it all. If there's any negativity, we did that. I take ownership of that. If there's any good, Jesus. If there's any bad, all me. Remember that. Any good, Jesus. Any bad, all you. All you. But if his glory, now here's what's what's shocking. If his glory is going to be displayed to us through all the ages to come, do you not think it matters now? God's wanting you to get a kickstart on this thing before you get to heaven. This is like a warm-up. This is like a warm-up to come. People say, I don't sing that song, y'all sing it. I got no idea what them words are saying. I ain't never heard it before, preacher. Well, what in the world are you going to do in heaven? Because when you get to heaven, you're going to learn a new song. Oh, my, what you going to tell Jesus then? I ain't singing, Jesus, because I ain't never heard it before. He might ask you, what side are you on? We come up with some of the most insane things in church. Stuff that don't even make sense. So scared to actually enjoy Jesus and enjoy the trip. God help us if the Holy Ghost breaks out in you. Man, I'd like to see that in all of us. 
Man, don't ever tell me to calm down in church. I might need to calm down at the ball game. You know, I might be a little flesh act there, hollering at the refs and all that. But I'm going to tell you something. There's something wrong when Christians aren't happy when they're at least at church. Man, I, I see it all the time. Sit there like a knot on a log. Arms crossed. I mean, unless we sing in 14 stanzas of the hymn, Amazing Grace, you ain't going to sing. Well, I appreciate Amazing Grace, but I'm going to tell you that was a new song, and there were people back in that day that hated it because it, they considered it a song that was sung at the bar. They thought that was the most worldly song when it came out. My, my, what, what is wrong with us? I'll tell you, we are for, forgotten to give all the glory to God. We start taking credit for things. And when we do that, you know what God will do? He'll let you take the credit. And you know what that amounts to? Nothing of eternal value. When we start taking credit for it, it has no eternal value at that point. It's all temporal. But look in your handout at Ephesians. There's a verse there, Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together, notice that, in heavenly places. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. You know, you know what that verse, and I heard a preacher preach on this, and he, he titled that, uh, this message. You, you know, this, this is, you're going to be a trophy of His grace to display for all to see. The angels, absolutely, the whole heavenly angelic, realm is going to be an amazement when you show up. When believers show up in heaven, uh, when they die, um, obviously uh, when Christ raptures us and, 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 and redeems his entire church at once, uh, obviously there will be a great number going at that moment. But for all this time, every time a believer shows up in heaven, you know the angels marvel at that? And the reason they marvel at that because that is something that they have never experienced. What is that? The redemptive work of the cross. They're looking at every one of us and go, you're the reason he died. Yep, I know it don't look like much, but I am. And their, their thing is not, oh, that's bad. Their whole thought is this, wow. You've experienced something I have not been able to experience. This is an incredible thing. It really is. And so we are going to be absolute trophies of God's grace for all eternity. Would you look at verse 6 and 7 there? I'd like to move forward in Galatians just for a moment, and then we'll park it somewhere around here. Now, now Paul changes now from verses 1 through 5. He establishes his apostleship and his authority. He defends that. He, 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 he also lets them know in verse 2 um, to whom the letters are being addressed to. Verse 3, he, he, he affirms to them and lets them know uh, of what's been given and what has been offered to them. But then in verse 4, he tells them how it was given. He, he tells them of the actual... Um, how this was actually brought to them, how we received this, the avenue in which it was given. And then in verse 5, once he does all that, he just absolutely has a praise party. But then in verse 6, something changes. Notice in verse 6 what he says. And now we start to get into the context of the matter in which the letters were really written because of the issues that were at hand. I marvel. Now, if you were to say, I marvel, that is a wonderful statement. But it depends on what you are marveling at. It depends on what this is referring to. So that's not a problem when he says, I marvel. 
it would be wonderful if that was followed up with something that was good and that was right. But notice what he says. I marvel that you, ye, are so soon removed. That you are so soon removed from Him, Christ, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, folks, we have a problem now. Verse 7, <clears throat> which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert, corrupt, change the gospel of Christ. In your handout it says this, Paul could not believe that the Galatian believers had turned from him, talking about Paul now, the one who shared the gospel of grace with them, the one who's taught this to them, and allowed themselves to be duped and tricked by legalistic Jews who had infiltrated the church. That's why he says, I marvel. Maybe you don't know what the word marvel means. The word marvel means to be astonished. It means to be amazed. It means to be in wonder of a thing. I am in amazement. Not good. I am shocked. I am in astonishment. I am absolutely in wonder. How could this happen? Because there's no excuse for it. See, Paul knew thee. Paul knew these folks. Paul knew them. Paul also knew the Judaizer, the Jewish legalist of the day. Paul had taught these folks the law of grace, not of legalism. And he could not believe that not only were there false teachers there. That's not the only part. That's part of it. That's part one. He also couldn't believe that they followed it. That's part two. Not only that there were false teachers that were let in, but that they actually followed it like little ducks. Paul says, I'm so, I'm so astonished that you are removed. You know, there's a word in the word removed. Can you catch that? Look at your Bible. It says that you are so far, that you are so removed. Do you, there's a word in the word removed. It, it's the actual foundational word. What's the word there? To remove means that's it again i am so amazed paul says i am i am just astonished that you left your roots i can't believe that you moved from your position people say and paul talks about this later in the chapters and we'll get into it Paul say, oh, brother, you can't, you can't lose your salvation. And that is true. Amen for that. However, you can leave the faith. You can abandon your faith. You can give up on it. You can stop it. I didn't say you can lose your salvation. Let's make sure we're clear about this. Paul said they were had moved from their position. Now, he didn't say, well, bless God now, I guess you need to get saved again. That's not what he said. He gave no reference about salvation. He gave reference to position. I believe there are and can be Christians who absolutely get out and away from the faith that they once believed in. You know what that's called? That's called carnal Christianity. You do realize that you can be saved and disobey, don't you? Yes. 
again, please don't confuse this with anything about salvation now. Paul says they had moved. Paul couldn't believe this. What happened? They traded grace for law. Can you believe that? You wouldn't do that now, would you? Surely you wouldn't trade what you used to believe in this Bible and compromise a little bit, would you? Surely that wouldn't be the church today. Paul says, you traded grace for law. This broke, it, broke his heart, and it should ours too. Now I want you to look once again at verse 6, and we'll find a place to park here in just a moment. I, I think it's close to time that we need to leave or get out for a while. Look at verse 6 again. I'd like to look at the word once again at removed. You are so soon removed. The word removed You know the word repent means to change one's my, my, mind, to change one's mind. You know it also mean, it means to it means to turn. You know what this word means? It literally means to turn away from. It literally means to turn away from. So, so don't tell me you, you can't turn away from God. Oh, yes, you can. People do it all the time. They were walking this way once in faith, and all of a sudden, oh, that sounds good. That might be true. I think I'll take a little bit of the law and a little bit less grace. That sounds right. And all of a sudden, they turned it and started following this way. They turned away. They had turned from Paul, who had called them into the grace of Christ, to these false teachers. As a result, their love for Paul and even the true gospel had begun to diminish. It had, dimin it had uh, been uh, a change to being cool and cold. Could it be, could it be, could it be that the church is ineffective in evangelism and discipleship today? Could it be, could it be because we've gotten away from God's book? Could it be that we are so soon removed that we are no longer following the grace of Jesus Christ? I think it makes complete sense, doesn't it, where the church is today and why there's a problem in the church. So I want to give you a word of caution to just let us know that we can all be in the same boat and it says this in your handout. What happened to these Galatian believers can happen anywhere. Do you see that there? It's at the very bottom of page one. You can't miss it. We haven't even flipped the page yet. What happened to the Galatian believers can happen anywhere. I want you to look up. Go to the book to the right of where you are, Ephesians this will be the last verse I have you look up. Ephesians 4, 14. Okay? And then I'll ask you a question. Notice verse 14. That we henceforth, this is Ephesians 4. I hope I didn't say Galatians. Ephesians 4, that's one book to the right of Galatians. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lay, lie in wait to deceive. Paul says, wait a minute. If you are rooted in this, there's no way that you can be tossed to and fro. But my friend, if your roots aren't deep in the Bible, this is what will happen to you. There are false teachers everywhere hoping to deceive baby, immature, not rooted Christians. That's what happens. And in your handout, there's a question. The Jewish legalists had come to proclaim in a gospel that was different than Paul's gospel. What was that gospel? What was different about it? I mean, after all, that's what he says. I marvel 
But so many of you are removed from what you've been called into, what you've been taught for me in the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that will trouble you, that cause an issue, that cause a problem, and a stir, and would pervert, corrupt, rust out. I mean, they would actually corrode it, the gospel of Christ. What is that gospel? Next time I'll tell you what it is. And it's real simple. It's real simple. But I'm not going to tell you tonight. I'll leave you a little cliffhanger. Maybe that'll draw you back next time. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us the Bible. We need it. God, help us to stay true to your word and true to you. There is no doubt that we can easily be swayed and pulled away if we're not taught the Bible. So God, help us to be rooted and grounded in you. And as Paul said, built up in you. That we may be built up in Christ. Not easily deceived, not tossed to and fro. Lord, I, I don't want that to be me. But there's only one way that that will not happen. And that is for me to desire the sincere milk of the Word of God, that, that we absolutely are fed strong meat of the Bible. So God, thank you for the Word. Thank you for these folks coming tonight to be a part of the study. I pray that they were encouraged, challenged, and nourished as Christians. I pray that we will have a Christ-filled week, and we do give you that glory all the honor that's due. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.